My name is Michael White. I serve as uh, the lead pastor here, which means I do uh, most of the preaching and teaching, uh, but not all of it. And just want to reiterate what uh, Pastor Josh said. If you're a guest with us, especially glad that you're here. I don't know, brother, maybe you said it, maybe you did. I can't remember if I heard it or not, but we like to say often, and I'll just say it again, uh, even if you maybe already said it, uh, this is a safe place for you, kind of no matter where you're at in life, uh, what your history is, what your present is, even uh, whether you're a skeptic or a seeker, um, or you don't know the Lord at all, you're just here. Um, we are, we're thrilled that you're here with us, and I just uh, want you to come back. I will be glad to dialogue, get coffee, uh, lunch with you sometime, uh, either way, on anything about uh, Christianity, anything from the message. And so I uh, just know, safe place uh, for you to be, and uh, just welcome uh, from us. We are uh, going through a, a series in the book of Colossians. If you want to go ahead and turn there, Colossians is in the New Testament. Um, and we started it a few weeks ago, um, and we're calling it Gospel Grounded. We think that's a good summary of what the message overall of what the book of Colossians uh, is. And so uh, we've been going through, uh, we're kind of, I think, third, third message into this. And so Paul has kind of gave an introduction. He's the author of the book of Colossians. He gave an introduction uh, at the beginning. And now today, the text we're going to be in, uh, uh, chapter 1, uh, verse 24, on down to 2-5, um, we're reaching kind of a transition point in his letter with them. He's about to go in on some things uh, next week. Um, and what he's doing is he's writing the church of Colossae to stand firm. There's some false teachers. We're not exactly sure what they're teaching. We have a decent idea, but we're not uh, rock solid certain. But there's some false teaching uh, coming in. He's trying to encourage them uh, to stand firm against that false teaching. He's, he's been praying for them, encouraging them uh, to stand uh, in the truth that uh, has been delivered to them. He's reminding them. We saw this last week of the support supremacy and the sufficiency of Christ. And so before he addresses the false teaching, which he's going to do uh, in our text next week, um, he's going to get personal today. Um, he's going to share his, his personal sense of calling, uh, what God has done in him, his vision of ministry, his heart uh, for them and the struggle that he has for them, his sense of responsibility that he has for their spiritual well-being and their growth um, in the gospel. And so today is about calling, really missional calling Paul's missional calling, and then ours. Now, when we, we think about calling, um, sometimes we can think um, in like grandiose terms. So like, for example, um, the greatest guitar player, this is maybe debatable, but, but maybe not, greatest guitar player of all time, most people would say Jimi Hendrix, right? So Jimi Hendrix, uh, whatever you think of his politics or whatever else, Jimi Hendrix was uh, you know, just amazing, right? I mean, the, the guy could you know, play guitar you know, behind his back, between his legs, play with his teeth, you know, kind of the, the, the stuff that, that he uh, would do. I mean, that guy was, was almost called or born, right, to play the guitar. Um, uh, Nikola Tesla, I think I got the first name right. Um, we think of him now because there's like an electric car company uh, named for him, and that's because he invented the electric motor back 100 years ago, or even more than 100 years ago. Just a phenomenal inventor. Um, what they say, biographers say, about his childhood was, as a kid, he would just dream and have all kinds of inventions and visions in his head. And supposedly he saw things in kind of a three-dimensional way. He had an eidetic memory, um, kind of like Sheldon off of Big Bang, if you watch that show. But uh, like he, he, so he had like a, you know, uh, Tesla. We're going with Tesla, not Sheldon. But um, it, so anyway, so he, he could see like circuitry and all kinds of stuff uh, in 3D in his head. And so he just, he's a guy that was born, right, to be an inventor, born to be that kind of genius and gift to society. But it's not just these lofty, grandiose callings that are significant, right? So sometimes we use this language like that person, I mean, even in our own fellowship, right? That person was born to be a teacher, like that he, she, they're, they're gifted in that way. They're born to do this. He, this guy is born to be in law enforcement, Right? He's born to serve and protect. It's just the way he's wired up, the way God has made him to be. That, that woman is born to be a mom. Right? That's her vocation. That's her calling. That's, that's what she's good at. That's, that's who she is. God has designed her to be that. And what I want us to think about for us, for all of us here this morning who know Christ, we have a, a similar massive calling and commission upon our lives. So as we look at the text, again, this is... This is Paul talking to us about his calling. So there's a little bit of a, a bridge we need to, to cross here. I just want to be really clear up front. Paul is an apostle. None of us are, okay? None of you are in this room apostles. Uh, Clint, good to see you. Brother Clint Darce is back and fam uh, with us. Uh, he's planning a church, uh, King's Cross Church in Greensboro. Church planning is sort of like an apostolic kind of thing. But, but brother, 
don't go putting on your business card, Apostle Clint Darst, okay? Like, like that's not, no, the, those gifts have ceased. None of us are apostles, but at the same time, we are called by God uh, for a specific works. And so the text of Scripture has one meaning, has different applications in different settings. And so for us, what we're going to do today is consider Paul as an example for us, as a model for us to emulate in our lives. We're not apostles. Again, hopefully that's been clear now that I've said it a few times. We're not apostles. There's some churches, whack churches out there, where the guy is calling himself an apostle, and that's just crazy. But uh, anyway... Um, what I want us to hear this morning from the text of Scripture um, is to hear Paul's heart, he'll hear Paul's heart for the lost, and be ultimately shaped and confronted, rebuked even, uh, by it as we think about our own lives. And so main point, uh, before we get into the text, the main point is that we are called, we are called to preach Christ so that all will know and be complete in Him. We're called to preach Christ so all will know and be complete in Him. Now, we're going to get in the text in just a second, but, but let, me, let me explain a little bit what's behind that mission statement before we just jump into the text so you can kind of be on the same page. And to do that, I'm going to, going to walk through just a few other uh, texts of Scripture. So here's the, here's the scenario. Here's the deal for us. If you are a follower of Christ this morning, then you have received the Great Commission which many of you, again, if you've grown up in church, you know this. If, if not, that, that's fine, but it's in Matthew 28, 18, 19, 20, basically Jesus' last words. Um, and he says, Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, teaching them everything I have commanded you. Right? And so, baptizing them in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so, we have received that commission as believers. It's not just the apostles that were there. It's clear that as they taught that the early church understood, no, this is binding. This is upon all of us. And so as Jesus taught, he says, you are the light of the world. You are Christ's ambassadors, Paul would teach in uh, 2 Corinthians 5. You have received his spirit and you go forward as his witnesses to the ends of the earth. That's Acts 1.8. And so this is exactly what the early church, who was made up of ordinary believers, ordinary people, just like us, right? This is exactly what they did. So listen to Acts uh, chapter 8. I think it'll be on the screen. It says, There arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. And so, again, they're all there in Jerusalem. God is doing phenomenal things. The Spirit has come upon them. They're growing up. They're teaching. They're having everything in common. That church is uh, busting at the seams, growing with life and new converts. And now some persecution comes, and now they're like, oh, we got to get out of here. And so they, they go. They split up. They go back. Probably some of them were in town for a Jewish festival. And so now they're going home, back to their homelands. And what do you think they did as they left that Jerusalem that's kind of the safety? Of course, it's no longer safe, but it was safe there for a season as they're hearing the word of God taught. Persecution comes. What do you think they do when they leave? Verse 4 tells us, Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Normal people. Normal people. They were there. They heard the gospel. They were converted. They were persuaded of it. They were coached up in the gospel, and then they left. They went out, and as they went out, they preached the word. Now, look who stays behind. It's the apostles who stay behind. So that's how we know it's ordinary dudes. It's ordinary people like us that are going forward, sharing their faith, planting churches. Even the book of Colossae that we're studying, we, we, or Colossians in Colossae, uh, that we're, we're talking about. We know Paul, Paul didn't plant this church. He's writing to them, but he's never even seen or met these people. It was Epaphras who planted this church. Epaphras is the guy that heard the gospel probably in Ephesus under, under Paul. And he's going back and he's teaching the things that Paul taught him. And so this is what gospel multiplication looks like. Not Paul, not Peter, not just apostles doing these things. It's ordinary people doing this. One of um, the most significant historians and uh, history books written on the history of the church is written by a guy named uh, Kenneth Scott Latteret. I think I got the last name right. If not, uh, forgive me if you're related to him. But uh, I, want to, I want to throw it on the screen because it's, it's a phenomenal statement. And, and I don't think we most of the time realize this. He says, The chief agents in the expansion of Christianity appear not to have been those who made it a profession 
or a major part of their occupation. In other words, it was their job to do it, right? He says, it doesn't seem to be those people, but men and women who earn their livelihood in some purely secular manner. Now, remember last week, if you were here, I bashed the word secular. There is no secular for Christian. It's all sacred. But anyway, you can listen to the message or talk to me about that. It's a bogus distinction. But anyway, sorry, purely secular manner. They spoke of their faith to those whom they met in this natural fashion. Again, it's, a, it's Acts 8, 4. As they were scattered, they, they preached the word. As they went forward, they talked about what Christ had done in their lives. And the Spirit used that, and there was fruit. Normal people, we are sitting here this morning, you know, almost 2,000 years after all this stuff has happened. We're here not because of the names that maybe you faintly know, names from the Bible, Paul's and Peter's and those. I mean, those people were significant. But the reason that we're here is because of names that we will never know. Names that will have long since been forgotten, but, per, but, but were persuaded of the gospel message and then taught it to their children, and their children taught it to their children. That's why we are here. The gospel flourished, the gospel, the church expanded because of average people. Paul says in Romans 10, familiar probably for many, he says, how are today they to believe in him whom, in whom they have never heard. And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And when you hear that word preaching, that's not what I do. That's something you can do, right? You can speak the word of God to someone and it can be preaching, proclaiming Christ. And so again, back to the main idea as we get ready to jump into this text. We are called, we are called to preach Christ so that all will know and be complete in him. And so as we do that today, uh, we're going to look at kind of four characteristics of a missional calling, a missional calling. It's our title, a missional calling that we have uh, from the Lord. So Colossians uh, chapter 1, verse 24, we're going to read down to 2.5 again. This is Paul talking about his calling and his experience. We're going to make application to us in our lives. So here now, this is God's word for his church, his people. Paul says, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for all those in Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. This is God's word. Let's uh, pray uh, as we start. Lord, we uh, thank you for uh, the the great calling that Paul is even articulating here. And we pray, Lord, for your grace, for your um, mercy this morning, that you would help us to understand uh, this text and even to bridge it well, to even think and consider his example and think about what that would mean for us and for our lives. So would you open ears this morning by your spirit? Would you do your sovereign work in our souls? Uh, We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so four things in this missional calling that I want us to see. The first is simply this, that a missional calling is outward focused. It's outward focused. All right, so we are starting at verse 24, but I'm going to pass it by and come back to it. It's actually, I think, one of the most difficult verses to understand the meaning of in the whole book of Colossians. So don't think I'm dodging it. I'll I'll come back. Um, but, But basically what he's saying in that, just a short version, is that he's suffering uh, for the sake of this church. And then now look at verse 25, of which he says, I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. 
And so, again, he, he has a stewardship from God that was given from God to him for somebody else. And do, so do you hear, again, that outward focus? He's got this sense of responsibility for these people. He does not consider that he exists for himself. He exists for them. And so just to run you through a few of Paul's statements like this, other places in the scriptures, Acts 20, uh, verse 24, he says, I don't account my life as of any value nor as precious to myself. If only I may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. So Paul knows that the point of his life is not his life. And that Right? The point of his life is not his life. He exists for another purpose. He says in Galatians 2, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And then Philippians 1, he says, For to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. The, the point of his life is others. The point of his life is other people that they might hear and know and be established in the gospel. And so skip down now to verse 1 of, of chapter 2. He says, I, I want you to know how great a struggle. I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face. Again, he is not thinking of himself. He's in a Roman prison, maybe house arrest, maybe something more severe than that. His thoughts are not on himself and how he can get himself out of there. His thoughts are about these churches, even people, Christians, fledgling Christians, people he's never even met. That is his focus. That is his concern. And he's, not, he's thinking about people, again, in Colossians, who he's never even met or seen. And so all of us are, are self-centered to some extent, right? I mean, maybe you don't want to admit that right now, but, but it's true, okay? The Bible says it's true, and it's just objectively reality. And so, like, just to pick on me, for example, because it's easy to pick on me, because I know myself to some extent, right? Like, I, I struggle to be selfless in my marriage. Maybe, maybe others out there would say the same thing. Um, but I struggle to be selfless in my marriage. That's the one, marriage is the one relationship to Jana I have sworn before God and a whole bunch of witnesses that I'm going to seek to serve her and love her as Christ loves the church. And I'm a sacrifice for her. So I've, I've made a pretty substantial commitment to her and to our marriage. And yet I struggle to be selfless. I'm self-centered all the time to the point that, I mean, I, I get frustrated. This is how silly I am, right? I get frustrated. Janet likes family of uh, animated kind of movies, right? So it's like she wants to watch Finding Dory and Life of Pets, and I want to watch, you know, the new Spider-Man or Jason Bourne or something like that, right? And it's like, and I get, and, and how silly a decision is that? How stupid is that in, in the grand scheme of things? But I get bent out of shape. Uh, just this past Friday, um, we're trying to decide where we want to go to eat, right? Maybe you've had this relational conflict, right? And, and she rarely tells me she's always kind of, you know, wherever you want to eat. Friday, she actually said, here's what I want to eat. And I looked at her, I'm like, I don't want to eat that. Let's go someplace else. <laughs> right? I mean, and she let me know. She's like, baby, when I, I, normally I don't tell you a preference, but when I have a preference, maybe we can honor it. I thought, oh, geez. I mean, right? I'm being self, uh, I'm, I'm self-centered, right? I'm self-centered about, even in the context of this woman that I love, and I've sworn that I'm going to be selfless for, Right? Then come over here to the Apostle Paul, again, just to, to use him as an example, not that he is perfect by any means, but like we look at him, you got him, he's struggling with concern for a bunch of people he'll never even meet. Ouch, right? That's, that, that's others, that's outward focused. Again, look at, look at what he's hoping for them. Verse 2, chapter 2. He's asking that their hearts would be encouraged, would they would be knit together in love, that they would reach all the riches of full assurance and understanding, the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. He had a missional calling that drove him. He was outwardly focused. He wasn't consumed with self-thinking and self-preservation and what's going to make me most comfortable. And so just by way of application, I, I want to ask you, where is your focus? Where is your focus in your life? Is it yourself? Or are you seeking 
joyfully to seek to establish others in Christ, whether it's newborn believers or just to help another brother or sister walk more faithfully and grow in their relationship with Christ. Are, are you aware, friends, are you aware that everywhere that you walk is a field of ministry, either for evangelism or for discipleship? So just think through these f- spheres of your life, your home, It's a place where there's evangelism and discipleship that should be happening. Your workplace, your gym that you go to, your favorite restaurant. Maybe you're going to the doctor a lot for whatever reason. That can be a field of of ministry for you. And so even for for those who are guests or or maybe new attenders, you're not not members here. You're attending for a while even. But but just as an FYI about Freedom Church, uh, so you'll know this about us. uh, If you ever come to a place where you want to covenant in membership with us, what we do, we go through a whole process really concerned about meaningful membership here. But at the end, and you, you maybe have seen us do this, we did it last week, but we will we'll have a couple or an individual or someone come up, a family, and we will uh, pray over them. The elders will pray over them. And as we are praying over them and welcoming them into our faith family, we'll commission them as missionaries. We will actually use that language, understand that we are receiving these people, these individuals, commission them as missionaries of Freedom Church to go out into the community, to go out in the places that they live their lives, and to seek to spread the gospel and to seek to make disciples. That's who we are. And so I say that, one, just as a, a vision and a reminder for those that are here, others of you that don't know, you're on the outside looking in maybe a little bit. Hold, hold us accountable. That's who we are to be. We are to be his witnesses. We are to be, again, making disciples. We don't do, you look at the things that we do as a church. We don't do necessarily evangelistic programs. We, we just don't do it. We don't think they're effective. We would rather have an evangelistic people. You are our evangelistic program, Freedom Church. The places that you go are the places that our evangelism goes. Again, your home, your workplace, your hobbies, those places that you go, that is where the gospel goes forward from us. And your pastors and your elders, we don't exist as some sort of hired holy men. Right? We've used that language before, but, but want you to be clear. If we go to Ephesians 4, it says, what? why has God given gifts of pastors and teachers? Well, he's given those things to equip the saints, that's you, to equip the church of God for the work of ministry. And so we're equipping you to do gospel work, and we lead by example. We should be you know, leading the charge in that in our own lives. But the church is this mighty missionary force that exists, to use First Peter's language, to proclaim the excellencies of the one who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. That's what the church of God is to be, a missionary force. And so if we have this outward focus that is part of our missional calling, that means that sometimes you may get weird looks or endure ridicule when you speak of Christ yeah, or when you speak up about your faith. It's okay. You have an outward focus. You're concerned for souls and not necessarily your own comfort, your own self-preservation, right? What people think about you, your own reputation. It might, might mean that, again, if you've got an outward focus, you sacrifice your personal time. Maybe you're like a person that's like, man, my house is my fortress Ain't nobody coming over here, right? Ain't nobody going to be in, up in my space. This is my zone, right? So as soon as I punch out of work or I'm home, nobody's interfering with that time. But an outward focus, again, if you begin to allow the gospel to permeate your thinking, says, you know what? Even as the apostle Paul is caring for people he doesn't met, you start to meet, at least you start caring for people that you know, that you love, and say, you know what? Maybe it means I need to sacrifice my hobby, my night alone, my this, my that, to get up in your life and to help you grow in Christ or to do something with someone that doesn't know Christ, to speak of him and even to push them to the Lord. It it means other things. It means that you might endure, it's just a carefully chosen word there, but it's it's faithful. You might endure a week in Haiti um, where there is no air conditioning and uh, heat, kind of like we're experiencing right now. So just imagine that. No air conditioning, you know, different strange food, bumpy Land Cruiser uh, rides that uh, will give you a car sickness. But it says, you know what? I'm outwardly focused. I am here on a mission. I can endure a week of that so that others will prosper and grow in the Lord. It's our calling. It was Paul's calling, and it's our calling as well to make sacrifices, to serve others, that others would grow and flourish in the gospel. 
Second characteristic of a a missional calling is this, is that it's word-centered. It's word-centered. So go back, look at verse 25 and 26 and see. He says, I have become a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you. And what is this stewardship? Last phrase there in that verse. To make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. Paul's central desire is simply this, is to make the word of God fully known. And that is this word, this message of redemption that God has been about since before the foundation of the world. It's a a message that he says has been hidden for ages, but it is now revealed to his saints, the people of God that he is gathering to himself through Christ. And so from the beginning pages of the Bible, God has been promising uh, to redeem his creation Genesis 3, he says, a descendant of Eve will come and will crush the head of Satan. Then all nations, all peoples will be blessed through the offspring of Abraham. A king will come from Judah's lineage. A prophet greater than Moses will arise. David's throne will be established forever. A new covenant for all peoples will be established that has a a new heart and God's spirit being given to us and an old heart of of stone being torn out. And now that is the the message, that is the mystery. When is that going to happen and what is that going to look like? And now this mystery that has been hidden forever has now been revealed in the person and work of Jesus Christ. God in the flesh, supreme, sufficient. Jesus Christ has come to live and to die in our place to accomplish the purpose that God has for him to effect redemption and reconciliation. And the news of the gospel is for all people. This is the glorious mystery. It's for Jew, but it's for the Gentiles as well, we see in this text. It's for uh, slaves, and it's for free. So that's a socioeconomic thing that was going on in the ancient world. So no matter what your, you know, what your, your wealth status is, your social status, whether you're male or female, whether you're red, yellow, black, white, as a kid's song says, right? It doesn't matter. You're precious in God's sight. God is seeking to redeem. Paul's ministry is centered on this word. He wants to make the word of God clear and allow it to do its work. What the scripture says about itself is that the word is powerful, that it's living, that it's active, that as it goes forward, it accomplishes the purpose for which it was sent. It's sufficient for the people of God to be complete and to be equipped for every good work. And so just as, a, as an aside, that's why we do what we do here. That's why we preach this word. That's why we walk through books of the Bible consecutively, week after week. Because we're just confident that, you know, maybe the God who did this and inspired this book the way he did knows what's best for his people. And it's not relying on some kind of ingenuity of me or Josh or some other preacher that's up here. But no, we're relying on God's ingenuity, God's wisdom, and just allowing him, trying to make it clear and preaching the word, allowing it to do its work. So Paul's attitude towards the word reminds me a little bit of uh, Martin Luther, probably because Martin Luther is getting it from the Apostle Paul. But Martin Luther, uh, just a quick history lesson if you don't remember, he's the great Protestant reformer who basically turns the world upside down uh, by preaching and teaching uh, the scriptures. Uh, that gets in the crawl of uh, the, uh, the church at the time, which we now know as the Roman Catholic uh, Church. Uh, but, but God used him to have a, a great reformation. This is actually the year 2017, 500 years since the reformation was started. Um, here's what Luther, though, says. I mean, he's just a towering figure in world history, Western history, church history. Here's what Luther says about the way God used him. It's, it's just so classic. He says, I opposed indulgences in all papists. In other words, people that promote the Pope. He says, I opposed indulgences in all pap- papists, but never by force. I simply taught, I preached, I wrote God's word, but otherwise, he says, I I did nothing. And then while I slept, and Baptists, watch out here, I drank Wittenberg beer with my Philip of Amstor. So he's saying, I'm in the bar and I'm knocking him back with my friend Philip, Wittenberg beer. 
I'm sleeping, I'm drinking. The word, the word so greatly weakened the papacy that never a prince or an emperor did such damage to it. He says, I did nothing. The word did it all. His confidence and its centrality was on the word of God. He said, I just want to preach the word. I want to make it clear. I want to be faithful. I want to speak it and get it out there. And I trust that the God who wrote it, the spirit that still abides by it, will use it to accomplish the purposes. See, church, in our missional calling, we're, we're not called to something extravagant, okay? This isn't for nerds, right? You don't need a PhD to do this kind of ministry. You don't need a, a seminary degree for this kind of calling. What you simply need is the Word of God. That's what you need is the Word of God to read it, to teach it as faithfully as you can, and allow God to do the work through it. That's good news for us. We just need this word, to, to preach this word, to teach this word, to read it, put it in front of others, and then to stand behind it and allow God to do the work. Third characteristic of missional calling is that it is Jesus obsessed. Jesus obsessed. We saw this, this beastly Christology that we looked at last week. Verses 15 to 20, Paul is Jesus obsessed. His, his life got flipped, turned upside down when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. Everything changed about the Apostle Paul. He wasn't the Apostle Paul then. He was Saul. Then he got a kind of a new name just to, to, to help him, even as he was ministering in different contexts. Everything changes. And so it's no surprise that he's rejoicing in what God is doing in this way. So look at verse 27. Speaking about what God has been doing among the saints, verse 27 says, To them God has chosen to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery. What is the mystery? The mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. See, the unveiling of this long hidden mystery is rich in glory. It is wealthy. It is powerful. It is mighty. And it is full of the splendor of God himself. God's character, God's presence are all over this work. That's where we, again, in the sense of his glory, God inhabits his glory in his presence in it. And what is this mystery that Jesus himself is inhabiting people, inhabiting believers by, his, by himself and by his spirit. And that is our hope of our future glory. And so God has taken, we see this, you can go back up verses 21 to 23, read that again from last week. He has taken people who were hostile towards him, people who were alienated. Again, think bad family situation. You're not speaking to each other. There's, there's beef there. He has taken people that are in that relationship with himself, and he has now made reconciliation. Paul is piling up words here to try to express the beauty of what is happening in the gospel. The riches of this glorious mystery have now been unveiled, and Christ is in us so that we have hope of future glory. And this is a wonderful, rich thing. And so as we saw, again, the aim of Paul's calling is to make the word of God fully known. And what that means is if we want this book to be fully known, then Christ will be fully known. He will be known in love. He wants to proclaim Christ. And so if we were going to have a slogan as a, as a church or even as Christians in general, you know, every business has got a tagline or a, a slogan, right? So Nike is just do it, right? Uh, bounty uh, paper towels, quicker, thicker, picker upper, something like that, right? Um, maybe theirs isn't so good because I can't keep track with it. Bojangles is, it's bow time, right? Carolina Panthers even in, in sports, right? keep pounding, right? If it's us as a church or as Christians, it would be re, we preach Christ. Or verse 28, as it says in the ESV, him we proclaim. That is our tagline. That is our slogan. That is what we are about. We preach Christ. Him we proclaim, it says in verse 28, warning everyone, teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Again, what does he say in Corinthians 2? We talk about this all the time here, this verse in particular. He wants to know, Paul says, I don't want to know anything except for Christ and him crucified. That's the central goal of my life. I want to know Christ. He wants to preach Christ. 
And then he says, I want to warn and teach everyone. This is a serious message with real consequences. He wants to teach with all wisdom that everyone would grow up, would be mature, that would be complete in Christ. And notice too, just look closely at that verse, verse 28, and see the number of times you get everyone or all there. Again, he is, he is striving to, to make the gospel known to every single person. He warns everyone. He teaches everyone. Again, he doesn't care who you are. He doesn't care what your background is. He doesn't care what is sitting in your bank account or is sitting in your driveway. He doesn't care where you live, what color your skin is. This is what a missional calling looks like. It's trying to present to everyone to care in some sense, be outwardly focused, right? For everyone to proclaim Christ, to present everyone mature in him. And this means even, this maybe presses on you a little bit, right? This is that obnoxious person that you can't stand. They're included in that everyone, right? The family member that it's like, oh, they're at the family reunion. Oh man, I don't know what I'm going to say to them or how I'm going to avoid like talking to them, right? No, our mission is everyone, our mission is that way. And so, again, this morning, I mean, I don't know who all is gathered here. I mean, a lot of familiar faces, some that aren't. Maybe you're a skeptic here this morning. Maybe you are caught up in some sort of entangling sin that nobody knows about this morning. Here's, here's the good news of the gospel. No matter who you are, no matter how far you are from him, God has come to, to draw you to himself. He's, Christ has come to draw people who were far off and to bring you near. Doesn't matter how strongly you might disbelieve in him. Doesn't matter how deep and dark maybe you feel your particular sin is. Again, he's writing. <laughs> yeah, remember the guy who is writing this? He's the guy that at one point is trying to kill and destroy the church of God. Okay, so he knows just a little bit about redemption stories. Okay, he has done that thing, and God has transformed him, so that now he is planting churches and writing to people he's not met. Again, this is a magnificent transformation. And so if God can do it for him, he can do it for you. So that's, we think about irreligious people sometimes, people who are far from God. But then what about the people who are the Pharisees? They put on this good show, this good appearance. They present and they front like they've got it all together. Well, guess what? God is pursuing you as well. He's pursuing you even in your pride, even in your self-confidence, in your boasting. You may have been in church your whole life. You may look good on the outside, but yet you could still personally be outside and apart from the grace of God. And so I urge you, kind of no matter what camp you're in, religious, irreligious, would you turn this morning and be reconciled to Christ? He is willing and able. He desires to rescue you and to save you. The reason we are so obsessed with Christ is in chapter 2, verse 3. Paul kind of explains the deal here. He wants people to come, if you just back up and pick up the context a bit, he wants them to come to understand all the riches, the full assurance of wisdom, understanding, knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. And then he goes in, in verse 3, he says, In whom, in Christ, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. If you would be wise, pursue and know Jesus Christ. If you would want to be rich, Pursue and know Jesus Christ. In him is wealth. In him is treasure. He has all wisdom, all knowledge. It is all his, and that is where life and goodness and satisfaction is found. There is nothing better, there is nothing truer, there is nothing wiser than Christ. So if you're here as an intellectual in the room this morning, you should feel no shame to, to throw yourself fully upon the gospel. It's what great thinkers, some of the world's greatest minds have been Christians. Augustine, Aquinas, Luther, Calvin, Edwards. They have shown throughout history that this is a a reasoned, robust, sensible faith, defensible faith. And so Paul is saying, no, come and find fullness and satisfaction here. Probably Paul is sliding the false teachers who are there in Colossae and who are saying, whispering various things and saying, yeah, you have Jesus, but you need this. 
You need to add this to Jesus and then you'll be complete. Paul says, no, 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 no. All knowledge, all wisdom, all the treasures of those things are in Christ. There is none other. There is no secret knowledge to be found. It is all in Christ. Paul is Jesus obsessed. Ultimately, we preach Christ because that's all we have, because that's all we need. In him is all wisdom, in him is all knowledge. Last characteristic, missional calling, is that it is struggle-filled. Struggle-filled. I saved it for last so you wouldn't run out um, because this is the, uh, the best or maybe the hardest for last. Contending for this mission to which God has called us is not easy, contrary to what some TV preachers might uh, tell you. Um, look, at, look at what Paul says back to the difficult verse in verse 24. He says, Now I, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. In my flesh I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. Now, again, this is the, one of the more difficult texts to interpret verses in all of Colossians. He says, I, I'm rejoicing for your sufferings um, on your behalf for your sake. So that's, that's interesting. And then... You know, why, like, why is he suffering and serving people he's not met? Um, so that's one thing. And then he makes this strange claim um, that he's filling up what's lacking in Christ's afflictions. Um, so I mean, we should know, and I'll explain in a second, we should know he's not talking about deficiencies in Christ's cross. Um, why? Well, because if we go back, I mean, he's just done the Jesus bomb last week, right? He's just gone through and talked about the supremacy, the sufficiency of all that Christ is and all that he's done. So surely if he's allowed to be logically consistent, that's not what he's saying. Um, so probably what he is, is getting at um, is, is that he's drawing on a teaching that understands the time uh, between uh, the Messiah's first coming and second coming as being like birth pains. So you can see that language, the birth pain language in Matthew 24 and uh, Mark 13. It's filled with disasters. It's filled with sufferings. And mas- the Messiah's followers are also participating in those, those woes or those afflictions of Christ, which I think is what the reference to Christ's afflictions are. The afflictions that go along with being a part of his follower. And so Paul taught in Acts 14, he says, with many tribulations, we will enter the kingdom of God. So that seems to be what he's saying. And, and probably um, it's a, a Jewish tradition he might be drawing on that these, um, these afflictions have a certain number of them. There's a fixed number. And so he's kind of saying, hey, I'm trying to take on in my flesh as much suffering for your sake as I can so that if I take it somehow on myself, then you won't have to endure it. So that seems to be what he's saying. And he's rejoicing right there in the midst of his sufferings because he's, he's excited. The fact, that the, the fact that these sufferings and birth pains are happening means Messiah has come and Messiah is coming again. So he's rejoicing in the fact uh, that Christ will eventually come back again. He will reign as a king. He will put away all suffering and death forever. And so if there's a word, though, that's capturing his thinking about the mission, it's the word struggle. It's the word struggle. Look down in verse, uh, in verse 29. He says in verse 28, he's talking about he wants to present everybody mature in Christ. And then he says, for this goal, for this purpose, that everyone would be, would be mature, I'm, I'm toiling, I'm struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Again, he is working hard. He is struggling. He is grinding for the sake of these people that they would be mature and know Christ. He is working hard. And then in the next breath, oh wait, before we go on, notice though, as he says he is working for this I toil, struggling, notice whose energy and strength he's using. It's not his own. He says, I'm struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. So even the Apostle Paul is pointing and saying, you know what, I am working, I am laboring, but it's not I, but the grace of God that is in me. It is the power that has been given to me by the Holy Spirit that I am struggling for you with. And then he goes on in verse, uh, verse 1 of chapter 2, he says, I want you to know how great, here's the word again, how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face. Suffering, struggling was part of Paul's calling And though not in the same sense, it's part of our calling as well, just in two different ways. One, we will all share in the sufferings of Christ. 
We will share in the sufferings of Christ, these woes or these afflictions of the Messiah. Again, don't listen to the prosperity preachers um, who twist and distort the Word of God uh, for their own gain. The Scriptures are abundantly clear. We will suffer for Christ. So just listen to Romans 8, very clear. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Check this phrase. Provided... We suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. And so we are his children. We are his heirs. If indeed we show ourselves to be genuine believers because we have also suffered with him and along with him. So suffering is a non-negotiable for a Christian. And there are varying degrees and and hopefully it's not to the same extent the Apostle Paul uh, experienced it. But we should not think that we can avoid it in our safe sort of Americanized culture that, of course, is going away. The struggle, though, isn't just passive. It's not something that just simply happens to us. It's something that should be an active struggle. So the second sense of suffering is, is, is a struggle that we should struggle for others, as Paul says he is doing. For this I toil, he says, struggling with all God's energy. I have a great struggle for you and for those who are at Laodicea. We should have this same struggle using all of the energy that the Lord provides to pursue and to push and to guide and to help other people be mature and grow in Christ. I just wonder, I just wonder, and this has been hitting me between the eyes all week, right? So now it gets to hit you between the eyes. I just wonder how many of you could say to somebody else what Paul says in 2.1. I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you. He's struggling in prayer for them. He's struggling in discipleship for them. Sacrifice. He wants them to know Christ and make them full and whole in Him. I just wonder, is that true of of you, of us as a body? That's part of a missional calling is to have that sense of burden, that sense of struggle. Just consider His example and and be rebuked by it, Um, even as I am. I think we toil when we use that word. We toil for lots of things. We toil for our employers. Because right, we have to, because we need a paycheck. So we toil for our employers. We toil for our homes and our yards, right? Trying to make our yards look good or our houses look nice or whatever. We toil, we work, we struggle for our hobbies, right? But I'm going to just guess. I'm going to guess that not all of us are toiling for the souls of our neighbors. And, and which is more important, right? Again, someday my house will fall in on itself, Hopefully years, you know, after I'm gone, right? But someday my house will not be there. Uh, someday my yard will be full of weeds and trees and, and whatever else. Someday my hobby will be, um, you know, a relic of the past. It's like nobody does that anymore. Why, why are you spending time on that? But the kingdom of God will remain forever. So normally I wouldn't recommend that you take uh, your theology from um, a movie, but uh, I'm going to give an exception, a pastoral exception uh, this morning. Uh, So Gladiator, uh, you got the character Maximus, right? Uh, Maximus, he's trying to fire up the troops. He says, what we do in life echoes in eternity. And that's true, friends. We have but one life. We have but a short life. Even if by reason of strength, 70 or 80 or 90 years, uh, Psalm 90 says, So what we do in this life with those limited years echoes in eternity. We must seek to maximize it for the kingdom of God, for the glory of God, for the advancement of his kingdom. We must live opportunistically for the glory of God and seek to advance it. This is the calling that God has for us as his saints. It's a missional calling. It's focused outwardly, centered on the word. It's obsessed with Jesus. And yes, friends, it is filled with struggle. So just as we close, again, this is Freedom Church, and so we have to have uh, Spurgeon quotes. Um, So I'm going to just end the bylaws, and we have to do it. Um, So I'm kidding, but sort of, not really. Um, uh, Spurgeon quote, um, I knew knew one line, but as I began looking at the context, I thought, man, this this just wrecked me. So if it wrecks me, it gets to wreck uh, you. Here's what Spurgeon says. He says, "If, if Jesus is precious to you, you will not be able to keep your good news to yourself. You will be whispering it into your child's ear. You will be telling it to your husband. You will be earnestly imparting it to your friend. 
Without the charms of eloquence, you will be more than eloquent. Your heart will speak, your eyes will flash as you talk of his sweet love. Every Christian here, he says, is either a missionary or an imposter. Recall that, remember that. You either try to spread abroad the kingdom of Christ or else you do not love him at all. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for um, your word. Thank you for the example uh, of the Apostle Paul that, uh, that rebukes, that challenges. Um, and not just his example, but the example of, of nameless uh, saints, uh, brothers and sisters whom we'll never know, um, who have been faithful, who have passed along the gospel so that this morning and at some point in our life we have heard it and many of us have responded and been uh, born to new life. And so, Lord, I I pray, God, that you would uh, chasten us, you would work in our hearts. Would you bring, even as we we sing, as we think, and as we process this word from you, God, I pray that you would even give specific names, specific faces, or people that we should invest in, people that we should speak to. And Lord, would you give us your energy, your strength, your power, your boldness to even do that, to speak for you and to fulfill the calling that you have on our lives. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the grace to know you, the grace to serve you. Lord, may we speak of you and love you and indeed prove to be your disciples. We ask it in Jesus' name.